Hello, and welcome to season two of the Vedic Conversation. We are delighted to be back and sharing with you once again. I'm Derek Yanford, a Vedic meditation teacher based in New York City, and I'm joined by my Vedic colleagues, Anthony Thompson in London and Rory Kinsella in Sydney. We've made a few changes this season and have invited a variety of guests to join us in the conversation. Today, we welcome my good friend and mentor, Lee Gold, a pioneer, leader, entrepreneur, and innovator in the dance community. Having been in the dance space for more than 40 years, Rhee was surrounded with dance and the arts from a young age and has continued to thrive by reinventing himself and his businesses, which have included the American Dance Awards, Project Motivate, the International Dance Entrepreneurs Association, along with the Dance Life franchise that includes a magazine, conference, and teacher retreat center. With the pandemic being one of the biggest challenges we've experienced collectively, join us as we explore what it means to be resilient during these uncertain times and hear how the role meditation has played in Ree's life, helping to give way to his latest iteration of bringing the dance community together in the virtual world. Have a listen, but make sure to stick around until the end where we'll offer a practical exercise on how you can apply this knowledge in your daily life. And don't forget, please subscribe to our channel. I'm so happy that you can join us today. But for the rest of our audience who may not know you, Re, could you just maybe just do us a quick favor and just let everybody know quickly a little bit about yourself? I love what you said, Derek. I'm <laughs> proud of all of those things and our long friendship. Um, I grew up in dance. I was born into it, you could say. My mother was a professional dancer, and my father was a professional dancer who then became a theatrical agent. I was born a twin. I have a twin brother. His name is Rennie. And we had a studio in the basement of our home. And probably until I was about 10 years old, I thought everybody had a studio, a dance studio in the basement of their home, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> so it was the norm for me. Uh, and then I not only had the chance to perform, but I landed in a variety of different places. As you said, I, I was a publisher for 14 years, I believe. I ran dance competitions for about 24 years of which you were a part of. I have a place called the Dance Life Retreat Center, which I'm really proud of. And I run conferences and have written a book on dance education for studio owners and teachers. But if you ask me the thing I'm the most proud of, it is being a member of our community. I very much believe that dance is about community and kind of the whole mission behind everything that I do is to respect each other, respect how each, as you guys might say it, practices how each one of us practices, how we pass on our passion and respect each other and gain from each other and learn from each other and help each other become better. Because as you know, in the dance community, it isn't always or wasn't always that way. But that's been my mission. And I can say all these years later that it's working for thousands of people. Okay, that's it. What, what would you like to? Uh... No, I guess really the best question, maybe the most relevant question to ask right now is because of COVID-19 and how it's mm. affected all of us. And that's maybe one of the largest factors of why this podcast exists, because we're spending much more time at home, connecting online or whatnot. What would you say in your perspective, the pandemic and COVID-19 has offered you 
in terms of reinventing how you do what you do. I love the way you use the word offered because I would use a different word. I would use, where has COVID thrown you? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But that, that isn't a bad thing. I just don't think it was like this graceful transformation. I think it was and is a roller coaster ride of emotions and securities. Uh, planning anything that maybe you'd love to plan for down the road going to bed at night and being sure about something and waking up in the morning and it's no longer sure. Um, And for me becoming and still there in Massachusetts, somebody who spends way more hours with myself than I ever have before. So the good, because there is, And I work with lots of people that I have to point out the good. It's transformed me. I have a new business model six months later. I'm a guy who on March 13th had nine employees, most of them full time. And now I have two and a half. And if you said, how do you pull off what you do with the two and a half? It's like I'm in control again. And I'll give you a, for instance, I run a conference each year and I would run around this country traveling on weekends to do conventions in different places where I speak. And people would show me my conference webpage before I left. And they go, this is going out on Monday. And I'd look at it, and this is no offense to them. There was a piece of me that wasn't there. Now I'm creating every web page. <laughs> I'm responsible for everything that's out there. And yes, it's more work, but the vibe is back. Mm. So now that I have my two and a half employees, <laughs> I'm going back really slow and maybe I don't need all of that. I don't need to travel every weekend. The virtual thing is open doors. Like I wouldn't have told you before March 13th that I could run a meaningful heartfelt seminar (laughs) virtually. And then about a month and a half ago, I did it with five rooms five ballrooms running at the same time and pulled it off. And now I say, okay, this opens it up to a worldwide dance community. So when you, what was the word you used? And I said, I'd use a different word. I think I use offered. (laughs) For me, it was forced, but I'm totally cool with it. Now, I'll give you a chance to ask me something if you want to, but this is what I say. This is important for people listening. It isn't easy. It isn't easy to live a life that was always scheduled. I'd be knowing where I was speaking a year from now already. To live a life where you are living in the moment, which is what I know you guys are all about. And the whole world has been forced to do it in some way if they've chosen to. Uh, The answers to what will make you happy are there and clear. And it's not the bigger house. It's not the nicer car. It's not for us in our business. Everybody idolized the person here. This this is great. 
that had 1,500 students flowing through their school every week. So you can imagine if you had 1,500 meditation people flowing through a facility every week. Everybody looks up and thinks that's like genius. Those are the people who are having a really hard time staying in business now. But the people who had 200 people flowing through their school every month that they had a good community with, they knew everyone's names, they're surviving in this time. So I look at that and I say, setting your goal to just keep working and working and working so you can pay more people and pay more rent and pay more, have more responsibility, we have to reverse that, that mindset and discover what it is that we really need. And what we don't need is to compare ourselves to someone and see that they have this and go, well, I'll be happy if I have that. Because I'm a guy who's had every one of the nicest things you can have. And it didn't make a, a difference on the happiness level. So I did believe at some, at, at, I did believe as I was working in my younger mind that those things would make me happy. I can't say I didn't, but I know now that's not the case. Okay. So, so the word, that's, that's brilliant and beautiful. I think it's a really great uh, introspective way of looking at either how the pandemic has thrown you or has offered you. But there was a word that you used that I'd like to unpack a little bit more when you're talking about survival, because I think there is there are people who are surviving and then there are people who are thriving. And I, in my opinion, from what I've witnessed you do, especially at the beginning and how you kind of changed, you know, direction and with creating a podcast and doing all these online things to bring the community together and to remind them, but also witnessing as you were preparing for that event that was supposed to be in person, switching it to online and having all of that madness and chaos to navigate. I was a little bit concerned. Like, I think you, you even mentioned to me, like you weren't really sure how it, how it was going to, to play out. So I, I would, I guess the question, or I would challenge not only did you survive, but you were able to thrive. Okay. I was able to thrive, but thank you for reminding me because I'm in the thrive vibe right now. But you and I were having conversations earlier in the year. I'll call it the months of April and May. That's why I called this a roller coaster. April and May. I did not have the same feelings I just described to you. I was scared. I was frightened. Personal issues going on. Hadn't really thought about running a virtual conference. All I could think about was refunding the hundreds of attendees' money and how that was going to bankrupt me. That's where my head was. And I said to you, so people listening will get this. I Here I am sitting here positive. I said, you better be here or can you come here after my conference? Because when this is over, I think I'm going to be <laughs> cracking up. I'm hanging on as tight as I can. But I'm going to crack. I know I am. And a couple of days after, the, you couldn't be here because of quarantine issues. But a, a couple of days after the conference, you called me and we, you kept saying in the conversation, you sound so good, you sound so good. I didn't get connect that you were connecting that to our earlier conversations until I hung up and I said, I told him I'd be cracking up. I can't believe how good I feel. I was so far from a crack up because I just pulled something off. Now I was exhausted. But yeah, I, I had anticipated crack up. I anticipated all the worst things for about six weeks. Well, I, 
I don't mean to interrupt you, but only the thing is like, you know, as we were preparing for this season and we were th- tossing around topics and we, we landed on resilience, I was like, I can't think of anybody else better to have on the show as a guest, because even as you were telling me all of those things, I was like, but you are this guy that has been there before, has gone through crap and has come out the other side. I've only ever really seen you do that. But it did sound a little bit different this time because you were really like, I don't know. And I, and I, I guess that's understandable because none of us knew what the world was going to look like. So in terms of resilience, like, I'm, I'm not surprised. I guess the question, though, too, is what would you say your meditative practice has okay. had in terms of influence about your ability to to overcome all of that and thrive? So as you know, Derek, I accidentally took the three-day meditation course with you. And I was not a guy who would have, on a, in any other circumstance, probably dedicated three days to that process. But our circumstance brought us to that. I did it. I went to places of um, I guess I'll call it a release. And what do I mean by a release? Where my mind did actually clear out. <laughs> That's a lay person saying, like, there's nothing there. Maybe some color, whatever. Um, beautiful whatever that is. I love the feeling. I did my mantra. I lasted about two months. Now I use it in a different way. I was a person who would maybe look, I told you about the web pages that weren't me. Okay. I'd mm-hmm. look at one of those web pages. And I would beat myself up because I didn't have enough time to do that web page, or I didn't say it good enough to the person who was working on the web page. Or somebody'd say something that I didn't like. And that would make me, let's say, lose focus for an hour, maybe even a day, if I'm being honest. Now I go, but a boom (laughs) into my mantra. It takes me about five minutes and my head goes. So when you asked me to do this, I was worried that I wasn't going to fit into the mold necessarily of how you practice. Mm -hmm. But if you're asking me if it made a difference, yes. Absolutely. I used it through this whole process. I'm very quiet about it, too. I just do it by myself. I don't have to explain it to anybody. That makes sense. It, it all makes sense. I think what, what's interesting with you or any of my students who have the type of life where they've got a lot going on and they've got to juggle and they've got to do things the way that I always see the benefits that this practice can bring to people, I don't know that my students always think that or recognize it. But even from after you learn till now, there are subtle changes that I recognize in you that I don't know that you always see, that I'm like, yeah, you, I mean, if I'm being honest too, I think, Go just the, it, like, no, right. just the way that you know um, you're you might not like you said. I think I witnessed you be at places where something disturbed you for a longer period of time. It's not as long. It's not that it never happens. It just doesn't continue for a long as long a period of time. And that, in my opinion, is the practice at work. It is allowing you to move and pass through those feelings a little more gracefully and not being stuck there for for such a long time so that you can get back to the business of designing 
even better web pages. And the next time it happens, that, that space is getting smaller and, and even less. But I, I think it's also great to talk about it so that you can kind of, like even the way that you said, oh, after I hung up the phone, that I remember what he was talking about. I think the way our practice works, it's after somebody else has kind of pointed it out to, the, to you that you go, oh, right, I do see that now. And I think when we do that, what ends up happening is you open yourself up to even greater possibilities because you're like, oh, what's next? What else can this practice, I'll say, offer me <laughs> uh, again? So I don't know if you guys have any questions in terms of anything you've heard him say. And Yeah, Ri, um, one thing that I'm sort of picking up on is that there's a lot of letting go, um, that you let go of the expectations of you know, continuing your business uh, as you had in the past. And then there was this crunch moment in, in April, May, when you really had to sort of recalibrate. And did you find that your meditation practice was kind of helping you ease into the uncertainty that actually you were enjoying the dance of change rather than the, perhaps the uh, tram lines of uh, routine? And predictability. Yes, I, I I would say it did help me. I oftentimes would go back to my mantra. This is what I'll say about the time, though. The answers weren't there during that time. The time was. It wasn't like the answers were coming. Think of it as you're tossing the salad and it's it's just all over the place. Each day brought you this new thing that got tossed into the salad. And it took until May and through the meditation and through the, as I said, uh, uh, being by myself, forced to be by myself, forced to think, forced without distraction, which I've been a really good person at through the past many years. I found my answers, started to find my answers mid-June. And it gets better every day right now. <laughs> Wait. I want to say why. Because all there is now is possibility. The foundation, this goes for everybody who has a big business, a small business, a passion. Your foundation is there, even if the house fell down. Now you get to build a new house. You get to renovate it. All the things that we have done in the past that if you've owned a business or a practice, you, you maybe has, have a policy or you do something and you go, wow, I wish I had never started that. Because in retrospect, you say, wow, I shouldn't have done that because I wasn't thinking how that would affect me 10 years down the road. We get the chance right now to recreate everything. I'm so excited. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I'm not making it up. Like, I work outside on my back porch and I take out a whiteboard and I write stuff on the whiteboard and then I erase it off after I've typed it in and I get excited. I'm just, it's interesting. I feel guilty. because Do you, I, do you find your intuition is coming into play much more? That yes. You go an intellect less that you're using that sort of innate wisdom and and intuition to just instantly come up. You just know it's the right answer. You know it's the right thing to do. It is. And since you brought up intuition, Anthony, I can tell you that part of the uh, hard times over the last couple of years uh, running my business was that I wasn't always running it with my intuition. I was running it with what other people were telling me is where we stood. And I didn't follow my intuition. So in the end, 
I knew where we were. But I still was surprised because yeah, I wasn't necessarily being told everything that my intuition was telling me. So I'll take that full circle back to where we started, which was I'm running my business now. And I hope if my my team is listening to this that they don't take offense because that isn't what I mean. I was too busy to do it. It's a good thing I had my team. Do you follow that? How you can look at that in different ways? Yeah. I interrupted somebody here. No, sorry. Yeah. Um, it was, I, I can see this kind of train of um, this theme coming through what you're saying about the silver linings. That's that framing that you just mentioned there. And it's so important, you know, the way that we look at things because events in themselves can be, you know, neutral. And it's only when we put our frame on it and say, this is good or this is bad. This is a disaster. This is an opportunity. Like you said, with the salad being everywhere, you know, is that an opportunity? That's an opportunity for you to get down and dirty in the, in the actual content of your website, you know? So I think that's really important that, that, that f way you frame it, but also looking for the positives, looking for the silver linings, which, you know, it may have taken you, what you said six weeks or however long to get there um but you got i there. still lose it i still lose <laughs> it and once it's been six seven months now here anyway i don't know where how it is where you guys are but i still lose it i don't want anybody listening to go wow look at this guy he got it together now no 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 i still lose it but much less and much more happier and do you have a way of kind of knocking yourself out of that if you notice that you're looking at something in a non-productive way mm -hmm. do you do you have a way to kind of jolt yourself out of it because you know some some I'm... sometimes people say right i'm going to practice gratitude and say look i'm going to try and be grateful for something today even if it's you know this terrible day i'm going to look for something and and cling on to that uh we'll go back to your first part of your question second part of my of your question is i wake up every day and try to figure out what i'm going to be grateful for and with this is how i make myself do it i put it out on social media and hear this all of the people that come to my events and all of this they say how do you know what's on my mind right <laughs> They all think I'm doing it for them, which I love, and I am. But I've often told them when they make that comment, you don't realize I'm doing this for myself if I put it out there in front of 10,000 people that I have to be it for the day. So that's the gratitude thing. Doesn't mean an hour after I put the post up, I'm not practicing <laughs> gratitude. <laughs> I keep coming back to that because I want people to know, even with this meditation thing, even though I may not do it exactly the way that I should, we have to, I lost track. Take me back, guys. To what? You're good. Oh, I wanted to make a point. So ways of reframing stuff, ways of, if you're not feeling grateful, how do you get back to it? And meditation is a way to do it, but maybe you have other ways. Well, no, the meditation is a way to do it, but to actually look around. And I know maybe this sounds too cliche, but you got food, you have a roof, you have a car, you have friends, you have the laptop that you're listening to this on or the, the headset that you're listening to it to. Is there not just the basic we live every day <laughs> and you woke up this morning gratitude that we can have and build from there if you take it down to the base the roots of what you could be grateful for because if you didn't wake up that day then the gratitude crap doesn't matter all the <laughs> stuff you went through in your life over the last 40 years doesn't matter so couldn't it be that 
you start with the gratitude and each day that you do that, you're building towards a life where you notice that gratitude more. Where instead of a lot of people, especially now and especially in the States with our political, I don't know, chaos that's going on, strong opinions, so upset, so mean, so disheartened. I look at it all and I say, but, but you're alive, your children are healthy, you're not pointing that out. You're, you have somebody in the medical profession who's a hero and you're not pointing that out, you're just seeing all the worst stuff that this pandemic has brought. And if you choose, there's just as much good stuff that the pandemic has brought. And I mean that, people go, oh, no, 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 I mean it. It may not be clear now, but in another couple of years, there's gonna be so many people who will say, I am so grateful for the pandemic. I wouldn't be this if it wasn't for the pandemic. I know it's true. And I'll add, cause I work with a lot of uh, teachers who are passionate for their kids. And a lot of students or teenagers miss things this year, graduations and dances and recitals and all this stuff. But those recitals were done in a drive-in in some cases, they were done in a parking lot. Kids who graduated had parades that went through the whole friggin' neighborhood and everybody marked by the houses. What they don't realize is that in 20 years, they're going to be excited to tell the story of their graduation. And there will be nothing in those thoughts that's going to go, I missed out on this. And that maybe you just need to like, you know, enjoy the parade that went by the house and say, this is a story I'll be telling the grandkids. We're of an age where we had relatives that would tell us, grandparents, whatever, the depression and stories about the depression. You realize the stories that people will be doing, the new generation telling about how we survived through this pandemic. I think I, everything you said, I love everything that you said. And, you know, my teacher, Tom Knowles, is famous for saying, you know, did your, did you go to the, your faucet and did the water turn on? If it did, today was a good day. You know, the fact that you have access to clean running water. And not only do I have that, I have it at different temperatures. In my refrigerator, I have it in different flavors. I have it in bubbles. I have it in a, a myriad of ways. Every day that I have all of that, great day, you know. And, but if it takes the pandemic to remind us of those simple things, then so be it. But the other thing of what you said though, too, I, you know, as far as your meditation practice is concerned, as far as I'm, you know, from my point of view, it's not about perfect practice. I learned 10 years ago and there were times when I stopped meditating altogether for whatever reason, I just needed to not do it. And so the journey that you're on as a new meditator, having learned only less than maybe a year and a half ago, is that you're going to find, too, the, the ways that it has brought benefit and value to your life, that it's not about I have to be perfect with my practice. You know what I mean? And, and the saying that we have in this community is that we don't allow perfection to be the enemy of good. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm. And I, I love my practice. It's non-negotiable for me. And, I, and I've had enough of a journey and enough of, a, of an experience to see the difference between when I meditate and when I don't. And I, you know, my, I, I think most of us would agree to, like, we used to drink. I don't drink anymore. I used to party. I used to do a lot of things that no longer serve me. And I don't miss them. And I don't, I don't enjoy those things. But that's after 10 years 
of practicing and, and having that feeling of, you know, great benefit so much that I went to India and studied and came back and, and started teaching other people. So I, I, I just want to remind you to, you know, take it as it comes and be, be easy with yourself with the practice because you already know that it's giving you benefit and the relationship you have with it is the relationship that you have with it. You know, there's no need to be, you know, considering yourself not the kind of practitioner you're supposed to be. That's not a, that's, you know, let yourself off the hook for that. <laughs> no, listen, I appreciate you saying that because after we first uh, did it, I didn't want to talk about it because I felt like I'd disappoint you if I told you. So it took me a long time to say, hey, Derek, you know, we never talked about this. And then I, I told you, <laughs> but it was my way of, of, of using what I, what I learned. This is another thing that I'll say is, and it, it was important to me. What I learned made an impact on me to where I want to bring it to my community and for them to realize so so here's this barrier you said to me re it's okay the way you do this my people are afraid of not maybe that if they don't follow the rules or they don't know enough about this they won't jump in. So I think it's important to let people know that it's uh, it's recommended you do it the way that you are practicing. But that what you just told me is okay for them because I think there might be more people interested. I felt like I failed, even though I was using it. I wasn't using it as directed. Yeah, there's, there's definitely that kind of, so when I reach out to my students, I, I have to, you know, I try to be quite careful about how I talk to them because I know this when I was a student is that, you know, I'd feel guilty that I hadn't, <laughs> I hadn't done it because in the course we really press home that you get the most out of it if you do it twice a day, you know, and no one's going to do twice a day forever. So it's it's important for us to remember that you know twice a day is optimal but once you know once in a blue moon is is better than not doing it um it's it's all you know it's all gravy it's all positive but it's we're not in that mindset it's like oh no i haven't done my homework <laughs> uh you know and maybe, That's it, exactly. maybe even cons considering <laughs> lying about it and then you go i can't be lying about my <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I won't lie about it. I just won't bring it up. <laughs> you know, you know, my teacher, Michael, you know, he, he's based in the UK, but I learned from him in New York and he goes back and forth quite a bit. And the thing that I remember him always saying too was, listen, if you come and you sit in on a group meditation and I've asked you, Hey, how's it going? And you say you haven't practiced in a year, I'll say great. If you say I haven't practiced in six months, I'll say great. If I haven't practiced in a week, I'll say great. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. And I think the, the really wonderful thing that maybe no one really realizes until you learn the technique is if you stop and you just, for whatever reason, you stop, you can pick it right back up. Today, That's true. It, it, you, you, if you needed a refresher, we offer that to you, but you literally could go, it's been 20 years. I'm going to close my eyes and meditate right now. It's not like it's, it's beyond you because you, you didn't follow the program the right way. And, and I hope that this conversation helps people understand maybe those who are a little bit maybe timid about going, I don't know that I could do the routine of how it's supposed to be, that it's okay dive in, let it be what it's going to be. And we're, we're here to support you in your journey. And with talking with other students, you might find out the same thing. Oh yeah. I, you know, you know, Diane Kelly, our good friend, Diane Kelly, yes. she learned from Michael as well. And she goes back and forth too, but she, that's the thing. Boom. You can pick it up right now. It's 
all good. So I'm 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 glad that you're talking about it. Honestly, that's well, great. Well, listen, if uh, when this podcast goes out there and I can post it on some of my pages and we have some dance teachers listening, I tell you it's worth it to learn this, know this, have this as a tool in your toolbox. You can bring it into your classroom. You can settle everything down when it's high stress that all of us go through at certain times of the year. So yes, I highly recommend it. I try to bring Derek in to do some seminars for me for my dance people, but it's hard because I want just the intro and he's Vedic and it's hard for him to give that intro, but we'll get everybody there. We'll get our dance people there. You know, it's it's like anything else. I think this platform hopefully will introduce people more to what it is that we're doing and its benefits. And even though it sounds like we're asking quite a bit, what people soon discover is that it's probably one of the most valuable things that they could do. And and to not to be whatever, but you know, Gandhi, for instance, you know. He's noted for saying, oh, I have so much that I've got to do today. I've got to meditate for two hours instead of one, which we don't, we don't meditate for that long of a period of time. But the idea being that the meditation practice actually gives you time, that that time that you spend settling allows you to have a much better day being making relevant choices and being creative as opposed to skipping it and maybe being reactive and all of these kinds of things. So, you know, it, it's, it's like anything else. It's going to make its way into the masses, but we have to have these conversations about it. And, it, well. and that's, it's about personal experience as well. Like when I teach, I always say, look, you don't have to listen to me. I'm going to show you a technique and then you're going to use that technique. And that's going to give you the evidence that you need to do it. So take a note of, when you meditate at five o'clock after a super hard day, how do you feel afterwards? Do you have more energy? Do you, you know, do you need to get drunk like you did five minutes before? You know, it's your, everyone's personal benefits from that. And that's the return on investment. It's not like, oh, I should do this because I paid you know, money to Derek to learn this. <laughs> it's when I wake up in the morning with a thousand thoughts in my head and I meditate, then I, get down to like five thoughts in my head and then I know what to do that day rather yes. than getting oh you know overwhelmed by the thousand thoughts but it's all you know it's people's personal whys for doing it because you know if you look at the benefits of meditation there's like a list of 50 things in every known medical condition it helps that but it's about finding the ones that are good for you because they're the ones that is gonna you know make you do it every day and like for me it was getting that second wind of energy in the evening because I had lots to do outside my <clears throat> outside my, my normal work and I used to just fall asleep when I got home because I was so <coughs> kind of ruined from the day and then I learned this this technique and then I'd be like boom you know back in the room there's another four hours in the day what can I do with it you know and that's my personal one but just doing it for the over the four days of the course you'll learn what that is for you and that's you know it's really important that it's your personal benefit, which will be different from Anthony's or Derek's or mine. Agreed. And I think that people, your normal lay people who don't have any meditation knowledge, don't know that necessarily. They may think it's an all in thing and that now they must turn a new leaf. But I'll tell everybody, I'll make you all laugh. Um, I did not go as far as Derek. I still have an alcoholic beverage every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> so if that gives you a fear, I think you can do both. Yeah, 100%. You know, it's not, it's not, kind of, it's not some religious thing. It doesn't come with these are what you must do and these are what, what you mustn't. What, what we've found as people who've been meditating for a long time is that gradually you let go of certain behaviors, but there's no, right. that's not because you're going, you're following a certain 
you know prescribed way of living it's it's that mo you know many people who have done this for a long period of time naturally stop doing certain things you know like drinking and for me it was very gradual like over a period of three or four years i got drank less and less until i realized oh hang on i'm going to stop now but you know it's a you'd struggle to find a smoking long-term meditator for example like you know you'd never you'd never see one just because it's those kind of you're more aware of the the results of certain behaviors because you've got you know you're building your awareness so but that doesn't mean that you can't learn to meditate as a smoker there's, there's nothing like that but you will learn right. over time what's what's because because you're you know you're increasing your intuition and you know hang on smoking's bad for me or drinking makes me feel tired every day you know whatever that might be you you get more awareness so then you make these elective choices but there's no rules around it you know i love how we describe it it's, it's everything's research you know if you want to do some horrendous drugs you know, that's research you want to commit some crime you know in the vedic <laughs> understanding that's research and you'll find the result of that you know um whether that's society punishing you for it or you getting the the the, the knock-on effects of the the come down or the hangover you know you'll you'll find out and then that's you'll get that enough times until you know <laughs> what what you should be doing that was so well said. <laughs> Bravo to you, Rory. <laughs> I mean it. Hey, I need you to say that to a few people. Um, I know we're probably coming to the end of this, and this could be its own podcast, but here's something I think of as a layperson with a little intro to meditation. And maybe I'm saying this because I'm, might have been that person myself. Do you think when someone is considering meditation and they are forced to go into themselves that they're afraid of what they might see or feel? 100%. I, I've heard that. I've actually had students, you know, the question is, where am I going to go? Yes. Where, you know, where where is this place that you're talking about? Or I can't imagine it or I'm afraid of it, which I think, again, just speaks to the nature of being a human being with the fear of the unknown. It's this thing that we can't really comprehend and wrap our heads around. And so what do we do? We have fear or resistance around it. That's That's completely natural. I mean, the other one is a lot of people think, oh, they're going to become this person that they don't recognize anymore. It's going to change them in a way that they're not ready for. And, and the long the, white robe and the beads and all of that. Well, or, or more, let, let's say you are a particular kind of person who believes that you thrive off of stress. You know, stress oh, is the yeah, thing sure. that gives you, you know, you work best under stress. And so meditation is going to make me a little bit more on, I'm not going to have the edge and it's the edginess that I really, that gives me what it is. And what, what I share with my students is it's not like that you're going to completely be a different person. If anything, the better version of yourself will start to reveal itself. And it may not look like the idea that you think that you've been using for all of this time, but you actually can get more done. You're more creative, you're more intuitive, and you're less stressed. You don't need to have that demand. You can, you can do it when you're stressed if you want to, but you don't have to either. But we get really gripped to the identity that we've made up, that we've had for a very long time. So of course, it, it might not seem like the thing to do. There's a little fear around that, and, and all I can really say is these kinds of conversations and sharing this with other right. people maybe gives them a window into going, you know what, I've been curious, let me try. Because at the end of the day, this, this, the other beautiful thing is you can stop. We're, I'm not going to come to your house <laughs> and see, are you doing it? <laughs> it's not, it's not anything, no. anything like that. So, And it goes hand in hand, I think, with our, our art. 
if you lose yourself in dance and know what that is when you lose yourself in the music and the movement, then you're already halfway there or you already understand what this kind of learning will give you if you give yourself the time to do it. Awesome. I just, I, yeah, totally. I want to ask maybe just one last question. Just because I'm doing a lot of reading, we're actually doing a little a bit of writing. Is there a book that you've been reading lately? You just finished your reading currently. And can we just maybe talk a little bit about that choice? I have a book that I go back and forth to. It's so funny that you're asking me because it's over here on the table. Hang on. <laughs> Now, I need you to know that I have thousands of books in closets. And the last four years, I probably read two books, whereas I would read, I don't know, four books a month, five books a month for a period of time. I learned so much. Then one day, now know this, I am working with people who are leaders. So I'm leading, doing my best to lead the leaders. And many of them are, are stressed and unsure of the future and aren't as accepting of the salad that they're going through <laughs> as I am. So this is where I'm at right now. Good leaders ask great questions. I read it three or four years ago. Um, You'll laugh, but I have a girl who cleans my house and she made me get out of an area and go sit in another room while she vacuumed. And this book was on the end table. And I sat on that bed while she was vacuuming. And then I read like four chapters of it for another hour and a half. So I said, okay, there was a reason that I went in the other room while she vacuumed. So yes, for me, this book, Anything that, how do I want to say this, helps me or others, or I can use what I learn to make them feel confident, even if when they go home after they have worked all day and they're unsure that they can get up in front of a group that they lead, their students, their parents, the community they built, and lead with confidence because that's what their clientele needs. They don't know right now, it's not about the dance lessons. What it's about is normalcy, kids in a room being kids, parents. I, believe it or not, they used to say, I, I hate running around all day, all, every day for my kids. Now they wanna go wait in the car in the parking lot <laughs> <laughs> and their kid be safe inside some place. And so the leaders that I work with are all, not all, right now at the date of this podcast, the average is they're 50% down. So if they had 300 students last year, they have 150 at this point. And last year would have had three. But I know that parents are just now starting to get their kids back to school, just now starting to things come back to normal, and that these people must continue, and it's not what they normally do, to call it a never-ending registration. They need to register kids for the next four months because people will become more comfortable, they'll see other kids in class and that it's safe and normal, and it will shift in their direction. But these people are panicked and I can't blame them because you know they have expenses, they have to cover their faculty, they make commitments. So for me as a leader, I must tell them to hang on and point out as many reasons why as I can. And then I feel bad as that leader if you want to go a little deeper on that, because some of them won't. And so even as I'm talking to them, 
I feel bad inside because somebody's listening to my words and they won't survive, even though I'm encouraging them to go on. Wow, that was uh, that that was a little uh, emotional for me to say. I didn't never thought about it that way. But so as a leader, <laughs> sometimes, and this is how it works for me. I'm doing this, what I'm doing with you guys, with forty people, and I've encouraged all forty people on that Zoom call as best as I can, and then I close the lid and I cry because it took everything I had. And I'm not sure myself. That's the life. And mm. that, that's great. That's great leadership, you know, taking courage to continue supporting and doing the things that other leaders need to do when you aren't sure. And again, I think that's why it speaks to your resilience, because I know that you will not stop doing that. No, I can't. I can't. I know no other way. Uh, you know that. You and I have spent enough time together. This is my passion. This is what I was put here to do and to make this dance community um, better and Maybe it's resilient. Maybe it's the theme of this podcast. Maybe you've been building all these 30 years of speaking and teaching to help them to be resilient at this time that none of them have ever experienced before, nor the rest of the world. That's something you have to remind them of all the time, that this isn't just you. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't just your state, your country. This is a world wide experience things like this do not happen very often okay thanks for sticking around to the end each episode we offer a takeaway in the form of an exercise you can do at home to start applying this knowledge into your own life this episode we were talking about resilience and the role meditation plays in our ability to reinvent ourselves and the ways in which we interact with others. We invite you to take a few moments to write down about your own experience of moving from in-person events and gatherings to meeting online in the virtual world. What was this transition like for you? Were you able to make successful connections? And how do you think the practice of meditation supports this needed shift? Write your answers down in a journal, on a scrap of paper, or even just into your phone. If you're happy to share your story, we'd love for you to join the conversation. And for those of you who are not camera shy, please feel free to share a video journal of your story with us. Please send them via email to stories at the vedaconversation.com or simply post them on social media with the hashtag the Vedic Conversation. And if you found value in this episode, please share it with your audience and consider giving us a positive review to help others find us. Thank you, and please take a moment to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already.